Mathematics is essential for data science and machine learning. It's possible to do basic things without knowing a lot of mathematics, uh, but it's very difficult to get non-trivial results uh, from um, machine learning libraries, data science libraries, without uh, a thorough understanding of the underlying mathematical concepts. To make the task of learning these mathematical concepts more, more straightforward, we have recorded a series of videos um, and in this video we start with an introduction to linear algebra for data science and machine learning. In data science, in machine learning, in AI, we usually deal not with single numbers but with multivariate uh, lists of numbers. Uh, multivariate means containing multiple elements or entries. Uh, mathematically speaking, these lists of numbers are called vectors. Um, we also deal with multivariate tables of numbers, so we have not just one column of numbers, but we actually have rows of data within um, and columns of data, so we have a grid. Mathematically speaking, we have a matrix. Therefore, we solve multivariate equations, apply multivariate calculus uh, to find optima of multivariate functions, and so on. The branch of mathematics that studies vectors, matrices, and related mathematical objects is called linear algebra. Uh, it's one of the most practically useful areas of mathematics in applied work and a prerequisite for data science, machine learning and AI. In this video, we aim to consider numbers as examples of mathematical objects. We then introduce a different kind of mathematical object, a vector, first in two dimensions, and then we start looking at the importance of vectors in data science. Why are vectors important in data science? After that, we start introducing vector arithmetics. Just as you can add numbers together, you can add vectors together. And you can multiply number, uh, vectors by scalars. To show how vectors and, and vector uh, arithmetics can be implemented with Python is our next step. Uh, we'll demonstrate how you can use the NumPy library to implement vectors in Python and then how you can use the standard Python syntax that you use for numbers, that how you can apply it to vectors. Uh, then we introduce the vector norm and relate it to the length of a vector. We introduce an inner product and relate it to the angle between two vectors. Then we consider vectors in three dimensions. We show how vectors can be generalized to four and higher dimensional spaces and demonstrate the importance of higher dimensional vectors in data science. We then consider vector spaces in general, not just the Euclidean vector spaces. We show that functions can also form a vector space and behave very much like vectors. Then we introduce linear combinations and examine the notions of linear dependence and independence, span and basis. After that, we introduce subspaces and show what subspaces look like in Euclidean spaces. We then demonstrate how one can obtain the equation of a hyperplane. In order to run the examples, uh, in order to plot the graphs, you need to do the magic command in Jup Jupyter, Jupyter, percentage matplotlib in line. That will enable plotting in the Jupyter Notebook if you are following this video and entering the uh, commands into a Jupyter Notebook. Then we need to import the standard math library. Then we import NumPy as NP because it's quicker to refer to it as, an, as NP because NP is shorter than NumPy. Then we import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. We'll use NumPy to, repre to represent mat matri uh, matrices and vectors and we'll use matplotlib for plotting. And as we'll also use three-dimensional plotting, we'll import from ML MPL toolkits mplot3d, we import axis3d. Before we start looking at vectors and matrices, let us recall that in everyday life we are used to doing arithmetics with numbers such as, for example, 5 plus 3, we get 8. And 10 times 5, we get 50. The numbers 5 and 3 are mathematical objects. Indeed, when we think about mathematics, we probably think of numbers as the fundamental objects of study. Numbers are used for counting, namely 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Such simple or natural numbers that we use for counting are called natural numbers. Natural numbers are precisely 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on, ad infinitum. We say that they belong to the set, that is, the, a collection of objects. In mathematics, the set, the collection of objects, is one of the key ideas. So if you want to learn more about sets, 
watch our video on set theory. So we say that they belong to the set of natural numbers and we denote that set of natural numbers by this letter n. It's a fancy letter n. If you're used to typing mathematical text in LaTeX, it's math bb n, right? But we'll just call it a fancy n because it has this double line. So we write 3 belongs to the fancy n or the set of natural numbers to say that 3 is indeed in this set of natural numbers, as is 4, as is 5, as is 10, and so on. Um, computer scientists believe that 0 belongs to the set of natural numbers, whereas mathematicians believe that the natural numbers start with 1. Um, this is just a matter of convention, and in this presentation we'll follow the mathematicians' um, convention and we'll assume that the natural numbers are starting with 1, and are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on, ad infinitum. Not all numbers are quite as straightforward, quite as natural. For example, the number 0, which computer scientists do include in natural numbers and mathematicians don't, wasn't invented or perhaps discovered, depending on what you believe about numbers and about mathematics, whether we create or discover or invent things, until much later than the natural numbers. We sometimes write the following to denote the set containing precisely the natural numbers along with zero. This is set theoretic notation. We say the set containing a single element zero, we put it between curly brackets to say, okay, this is not just zero, it's the set containing zero, just one element. It's a finite set containing just one single element. We call sets containing a single element, we call them singleton sets. So we take a union of the singleton set containing zero with natural numbers to obtain a new set of numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and zero. So we get um, a union. This is the sign for union. So we get a set which consists of all the elements of this set and all the elements of this set, which will give us zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So in mathematics, you notice that we use curly brackets to define sets by enumerating their elements. As in the case of the singleton set. Now, while the notation fancy n is standard for the set of natural numbers, we could just use curly brackets notation and write out this set. Or we cannot write out all elements because there are infinitely many of them, but we could set uh, we could write one, two, three, four, five within curly brackets and put dot, 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 so that you know um, you, re you can reasonably continue this, uh, sequence, uh, this set. Then there are the slightly less natural numbers. There are the negative numbers. M minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. So these, together with zero and the natural numbers, if we take the union of all the negative numbers, like this, negative integers, um, zero, and all the natural numbers, we get a set of integers. And that set of integers is denoted by the math bb, or fancy, letter z. So we can enumerate it like so, using curly brackets, dot dot dot, minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five. It's an infinite set, so we can continue it on this side and on that side, so there are infinitely many integers as well. Since every element of natural numbers is in integers, we say that natural numbers is a subset of z. And write n, fancy n, is a subset. This is the sign for subset. Um, and n is a subset of z, as we can see here. <coughs> two sets are said to be equal if two sets A and B are said to be equal if A is a subset of, of B and also B is a subset of A. What this means is that all the elements that are in A are in B and all the elements that are in B are in A. In other words, the two sets have exactly the same elements. In this case, we write, as we write with numbers, we write A equals B. The negative number minus 3 is sometimes referred to as the additive inverse of 3 because adding it to 3 yields 0. So 3 plus minus 3 
is zero. So minus three plays the important role of being an additive inverse of three. There are other somewhat unnatural numbers such as the multiplicative inverse of three which is one third. When multiplied by its multiplicative inverse a number yields not zero but one. Mathematicians also call it identity or unit. So if we multiply three by one third and we're doing this in Python by the way to show you the Python syntax for doing this we get one or the unit or the identity. The fractions, such as one-third pi e, along with the integers, form a set of real numbers, and it's denoted by the fancy letter R. Clearly, both n and z are subsets of R, so we can write n is a subset of z, which is in turn a subset of R, of the real numbers. So the real numbers contain negative numbers, they contain zero, they contain natural numbers, and also they contain fractions, such as one-third pi E, and so on. Real numbers obey certain rules. In mathematics, we call these rules axioms of arithmetic. For example, multiplication is distributive over addition. 3 times a half plus 100 is equal to 3 times a half plus 3 times 100. So what we have done, we have distributed the multiplication by 3 over the additions. So we have written out these brackets 3 times 0.5 plus 100 as 3 times 0.5 plus 3 times 100. The reason why we could do this is because multiplication and addition follow the axioms of arithmetic for real numbers. Now if you want to learn more about numbers in general and, and, and this exciting study um, is called number theory, you are welcome to read Harold Davenport's book The Higher Arithmetic, which you can buy on Amazon for example. Now, we are going to deal not so much with um, numbers, we are going to deal with vectors. One can think of other kinds of mathematical objects. They may or may not be composed of numbers. In order to specify the location of a point on a two-dimensional plane, you need a mathematical object composed of two different numbers, the x and y coordinates. Such a point may be given a single mathematical uh, may be given by a single mathematical object, which, which we'll call v in this case, and it will be 3, 5. So we use this notation, we use round brackets rather than curly brackets to represent points, where we understand that the first number is the x-coordinate, while the second is the y-coordinate. So the x-coordinate of this point is 3, the y-coordinate of this point is 5. When we were defining sets, the order of elements didn't matter. Moreover, the multiplicity of elements in a set is ignored. Thus, if we write curly brackets, as we used to when we define sets, Newton, Leibniz, that set is exactly the same as the set Leibniz and Newton. Because when we are dealing with sets, we don't really care about the order of the elements, we just care about what these elements are. Right? We just care about the fact that this set is the set containing the elements Newton and Leibniz. Or I could say that this is the set containing the elements Leibniz and Newton. We don't really care about the order of the elements. And also, by convention, we don't really recognize the repetitions of elements. So we have a set of Newton, Leibniz and Newton. It's actually going to be exactly the same set as these two. Because we, we, we just look at the distinct elements in a set. We don't really look at repetitions. So there are exactly two elements in this set, even if we write it out like this. We only count distinct elements when we are defining sets. However, when we are defining points, <coughs> the point with the x-coordinate 3 and y-coordinate 5 is distinct from the point with the x-coordinate 5 and y-coordinate 3. And if we look at a three-dimensional point with coordinates 3, 5, 3, this point is going to be distinct from these two. So the order matters and the multiplicity of the elements matters when we are specifying coordinates. We can visualize this point, 3, 5, by means of a plot. So we can produce this plot using matplotlib library in Python, <coughs> which we have imported as PLT. So 
we're going to plot this point here. You see, the x-coordinate of this point is 3, and the y-coordinate of this point is 5. And for reference, we're going to also plot the origin, which is the point with coordinates all 0, which is 0 x-coordinate and 0 y-coordinate. So we plot the origin over there, so we can see where our point is in relation to the origin. It may be useful to think of this object, 3, 5, which we shall now call a vector, as displacement from the origin. We can then read 3, 5 as go to the right of the origin by 3, 1, 2, 3, and then go up from the origin by 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So for this reason, we often um, Instead of just plotting a point, we represent a vector with an arrow coming from the origin in this case and ending at this point with coordinates 3 and 5. Once again, we can view this as go to the right of the origin by 3 units and then go up from the origin by 5 units. Therefore, vectors may be visualized as arrows specifying a direction as well as this point. And here is an example of this alternative visualization of a vector with an arrow. Two-dimensional vectors are said to belong to a set as well, called the Euclidean two-plane. All the two-dimensional points lie in the Euclidean two-plane, denoted R2. The set of real numbers R is sometimes referred to as the Euclidean real line, and we may have written R as R to the power of or R1, although this is rarely done in practice. So let us you look at how and why this is useful in data science. In data science we often think of the x-coordinate as the input variable and the y-coordinate as the output variable. Consider for example the diabetes data set from Efren, Hasty, Johnstone and Tipsharani paper Least Angular Regression. It's one of the data sets available in the sklearn or scikit-learn Python library, so we can load it using dataset.load underscore diabetes. Now we have this data set in this variable data set. In this data set, 10 baseline variables, age, sex, body mass index, average blood pressure, and six blood serum measurements were obtained for each of n equals 442 diabetes patients as well as the response of interest, a quantitative measure of disease progression one year after baseline. So we have 10 different input variables and one output variable, which is some number representing how far the, the disease progressed after one year. Let us consider points or vectors where the x-coordinate represents the body mass index, which is one of the 10 input variables, and the y-coordinate, the aforementioned quantitative measure of the disease progression. Um, and that is going to be the corresponding output. As a result, we get 442 two-dimensional points of input and output of the x and y coordinate. So we can do it in Python like this. We get the first coordinate we, we obtain as follows, and the second coordinate we obtain by assigning to it the data set target, which is the output. In data science, our goal is to find the relationship between the output and the input, if such a relationship does exist. We may be able to explain or predict the output by means of the input. One such input point in our data set is going to be 0 0.06169 and so on, 151. Another is minus 0 0.051 and so on, and 75. So we see that in the first case, the, degrees, the, the disease progressed further than in the second case. And the output, which is the some representation, some numerical representation of um, body mass index, in this case it's negative because it must have been normalized in a particular way, minus 0 0.05 something, which is actually less than in this example. And so on. There are 442 of these two-dimensional data points, body mass index and uh, quantitative measure of disease progression. Um, and the last one is given by this, is minus 0.07357. Again, 
it looks like the body mass index has been rebased, so we allow negative numbers for body mass index. We can visualize all these points by plotting all of them on an xy plane just as we visualized individual vectors as points before. So if we visualize the first, second and last points, we obtain the following graph. This is the first point where we see that the body mass index is the highest and the disease progressed the furthest. And then we have these two points, the, sec <coughs> the second point and the last point where we can see that the body mass index is lower. Sorry, the body mass index is the x-coordinate. So the body mass index is less than for this point. And also we see that the disease didn't quite progress quite as far. To get a better idea of the relationship between the input and output, let us plot all available points just as we plotted the three points above. The result is a scatter plot, and we produce it using the matplotlib library, matplotlib library in Python. So we just add all the points in our data set to this plot, and we can see that the plots, the, that the dots in this example are not random, right? First of all, they're, they're oriented around the 45 degree line. And we can see that there is some noise, that then they don't lie perfectly on the line, right? But they're kind of distributed in this shape, which reminds us of a Gaussian cloud. It's a familiar, familiar shape to a data scientist. So the scatter plot shows that the points follow a certain pattern, in particular the disease progression, the y-coordinate, the output, the y-coordinate, increases with the patient's body mass index, the x-coordinate or the input. So it's a good idea to bring the body mass index for a patient down. Visualization by means of the scatter plot has helped us spot this relationship. But before we could do this, we had to start thinking of data points as vectors. So we implicitly think of our data points as two-dimensional vectors. So we can immediately see why two-dimensional vectors are very useful in data science. Now, would it make sense to define addition for vectors? And if it would, how would we define it? Thinking of vectors as displacements gives us a clue. The sum of two vectors, u and v, could be defined by go in the direction specified by u, then, from where you ended up, go in the direction specified by v. So, if, for example, we have vectors u, 5, 3, and v, 4, 6, then their sum would be obtained as follows. Start at the origin. Move in the direction specified by u. Go to the right by 5 units, and then go up by 3 units. Then, move in the direction specified by v. Go to the right by 4 units, and then go up by 6 units. And what's the end result? Well, we can see it here go to the right by 5 units, then go up by 3 units, and then go to the right by 4 units, and then go up by 6 units. We end up in this point here, which we can also represent as a vector by drawing an arrow from the origin to the end point. Geometrically, we have appended the arrow representing the vector v to the end of the arrow representing the vector u, drawn starting at the origin. What if we started at the origin, went in the direction specified by V first, and then went in the direction specified by U? Where would we end up? Well, then we, we, we would have to start by <coughs> going, to the, going to the right by four points, then going up by three points. Then we go to the right by five points, and then we go up by three points. Um, by, three, by three units, sorry, not points, by three units. And we end up in exactly the same place. We would end up in the same place. So, more generally, for any vectors u and v, vector addition is commutative. In other words, u plus v is equal to v plus u. So it doesn't matter whether you first go in the direction specified by u and then in the direction specified by v, or you start by going in the direction specified by v and then go in the direction specified by u. We can visualize this um, by plotting u first, then v, or v first, then u, and the resulting shape is the parallelogram, and the sum of the vectors 
is given by the diagonal of the parallelogram, like this. Once again, the sum u plus v, which is of course equal to v plus u because vector addition is commutative, is itself a vector which is represented by the diagonal of the parallelogram formed by the arrows above. And here you can see the code that you can use to obtain this diagram in Python. We observe that the sum of u, but we're skipping because the code is not, not the main point of this lecture. Right, so we're going to press on. If you want to look at the code, you can, uh, for example, press pause when you're playing this video. We observe that the sum of u and v can be obtained by adding the corresponding coordinates. So u plus v is equal to the first coordinates added together, 5 plus 4, that gives us the first coordinate of the result, and then the sum of the second coordinates gives us the second coordinate of the result. It is indeed unsurprising that vector addition is commutative since the addition of ordinary numbers is commutative. So 5 plus 4 can be written as 4 plus 5. 3 plus 6 can be written as 6 plus 3. So this shows us in a different way. Uh, we have seen it geometrically, now we're seeing it algebraically, that u plus v is equal to v plus u. Now we're going to talk about another uh, uh, mathematical operation that we can perform on vectors, and that's multiplication by scalars. Would it make sense to multiply a vector such as u, 5, 3, by a number such as alpha equals 1.5? We'll start referring to ordinary numbers as scalars to distinguish them from vectors. So a natural way to define scalar multiplication of vectors would be element-wise. So alpha times u is going to be 1 0.5 times 5, 3. Element-wise means that we multiply each of the elements, 5 and 3, by 1.5. So we get 1.5 times 5, and we get 7.5. 1.5 times 3, we get 4.5. That is the result of multiplying by the scalar, by just a simple number, um, 1.5, the result of multiplying the vector 5.3 by that number, by that scalar. How can we interpret this geometrically? Well, it turns out that we obtain a vector whose length is 1.5 that of u, and whose direction is the same as that of u. And we can again plot these vectors u and alpha times u in matplotlib to see that indeed the result of multiplying u by alpha, by the scalar alpha, is a vector which is 1.5 the length of u and which points in the same direction. Now, what do you think will happen if we multiply u by beta, which is equal to minus 1.5, instead? Well, minus 1.5, element-wise multiply 5, 3, we get minus 1.5 times 5, which is minus 7.5, minus 1.5 times 3, which is minus 4.5, and we get a vector, which is 1.5 times the length of u, but is pointing in exactly the opposite direction to u, although it still lies on the same line. Geometrically, we have obtained a vector whose length is 1.5 times that of u, and whose direction is the opposite, but along the same line uh, of u, because beta is a negative scalar. In Python, we use the NumPy library, which we usually import with import NumPy as NP, to represent vectors as NumPy arrays. So we can represent vector u as a NumPy array consisting of the elements 3 point and 5 point. I put point there to indicate that these are real numbers rather than just integers, although they are integers. Um, when we work with numerics, we prefer to work with real numbers and v, which is 4.5 and 6, sorry, 4 point and 6 point. Now these points are optional because um, usually uh, the Python correctly interprets even if we do write integer literals such as 3 without the point, uh, but I prefer to put them uh, following the Zen of Python that explicit is better than implicit. We can then add vectors using just the normal plus operator, u plus v, and we get 7, 11. And we can multiply vectors by a scalar, 1.5 times u, using this star representing multiplication, we get 4.5, 7.5.
And we can multiply by minus 1.5 instead and we get minus 4.5 and minus 7.5. So let us look at a data science application. Now that we can add vectors together and then we can multiply them by a scalar, when we find a mean of numbers, we add those numbers together and then we multiply by 1 over the number, the number of numbers. Right, so for example, the mean of 3, 5 and 7 is going to be equal to 3 plus 5 plus 7 times 1 over 3 because there are three numbers that we're adding together. So let us go back to the diabetes data set, which we started considering. We save the x coordinates as data set underscore x. We save the y coordinates as data set underscore y. And together we these x and y coordinates, corresponding x and y coordinates, form points on a scatter plot which we have produced in Python like this. Now we can use Python's list comprehension to obtain a list of these data points. So data points, we are going to combine the corresponding x and y coordinates to obtain two-dimensional vectors. And then uh, these, we are going to store them in a variable data underscore points. We can see that the very first one is going to be 6.16, 1.51, well actually it's 6.16 times 10 to minus 2, and 1.51 times 10 to, to the power of 2, uh, which is just 151. Uh, then we use vector arithmetic to find the data underscore points underscore mean. So we add up all the data points. We can, do, we can write it out or we can use the numpy sum function to add them together, add them all up. And then we multiply by this scalar, which is 1 divided by the number of data points. And what do we get? We get the data underscore points underscore mean, which is minus 8.04 and so on times 10 to minus 16, 1.52 times 10 to the power of 2. And then we can add this data point, this, the, the mean of the data points, to our scatter plot in a different color. <clears throat> and we can see that this is effectively the center of mass of all these data points. This, the red points here, represents the data points mean. And we can see that it's located here. So this is a very quick application of vector addition and multiplication by scalars. So in order to obtain the mean of these points, we did a little bit of vector arithmetics, but we did it in NumPy, and NumPy did the bulk of the work for us. So direction from one vector to another. We have seen that individual vectors <coughs> represent a direction from the origin. For example, this vector u with x coordinate 5 and y coordinate 3 um, can be viewed as go to the right of the origin by 5 and then go up from the origin by 3. Now, suppose that we have another vector, say v, which is given by 4, 6. Um, in NumPy, it's NumPy array of 4 and 6. So we can plot them on the same grid. So what about the direction, f well, w u gives us the direction from the origin to this point. V gives us the direction from the origin to this point. What about the direction from U to V? Well, it turns out that this is going to be given by a vector, we call it D, which is V minus U. And when we write V minus U, we mean V plus minus 1 times U. So we have defined subtraction as in terms of ad addition and multiplication by scalars. Uh, so we can obtain this d in NumPy, and we can plot it. We can either plot it starting from the origin, or we can plot it starting from the endpoint of u. So we see that d equals to v minus u gives us precisely the direction from u to v. We can also plot it from the origin, like so. Um, so, um, if we draw D from the origin, we obtain this line here, this arrow here. But if we draw starting at the arrow tip of U, 
then we see that D connects the arrow tips of U and the arrow tip of V. Now, the vector doesn't just have a direction, the orientation of the arrow on the plane, uh, it also has a length, it has a size. We have already seen that u equal to 5, 3 and alpha times u is equal to 7.5, 4.5. They have the same direction but alpha u is alpha times longer, in this case 1.5 times longer. So we can see that is u and that is alpha u. How do we obtain the length of a vector? Well, by Pythagoras' theorem, the length of this line is going to be the square root <coughs> of the length of this line plus this, so, sorry, the square root of the sum of squares of these two lines, right? This one has length 5, this one has length 3. So 5 squared is going to be 25. Uh, 3 squared is going to be um, 9, right? And the square root of 34 is going to be 5.83, not 9518, and so on. And that is the length of the vector u. So we use the Pythagoras theorem to find the length of a vector. In NumPy, we can manually compute the length of the vector u by taking the square root of the sum of squares. Uh, when we just apply this, this um, star operation to the NumPy array, it's going to, to do it element-wise. Or we can apply the library function from NumPy called np.linalg.norm which we just applied like so, and it gives us exactly the same answer. So, distance between vectors. We have shown that the direction from vector v to vector u is given by their difference by v minus u, or v plus minus 1 times u. Um, the distance between these two vectors, the, the result of applying Pythagoras theorem is, is referred to as the norm. So we have used this notation here. Um, for vector norm, it's the double lines on either side of u. So now, to get the distance between the vectors u and v, we compute the norm of v minus u. In our example, it's going to be 3.162277 and so on. Now, let us look at an application of norms or, 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 or length of vectors, uh, let us find a neighborhood of a point. We have used vector arithmetics to compute the mean of the data points and add it to the scatter plot. So we computed the mean of all these blue points and this mean is this red point over here. Let us now compute the distance from each data point to data underscore points underscore mean. This is our red point. So we can use Python's list comprehensions to do this, and we can apply the NumPy library function norm. And it may be interesting to examine the histogram of the resulting distances. We see that they are concentrated over here, and then they tail off. In many machine learning algorithms, such as clustering, we end up finding data points within a certain fixed distance from another. We find the so-called neighborhood of a data point. Let us now compute the standard deviation of all the distances, and we can use the square root of the variance of the distances to the mean, and highlight those data points which fall within one standard deviation distance from the mean data point. Well, it's actually not quite right to call it the mean data point because it's not actually itself one of the original data points. So it's really probably better to call it the mean of the data points. Now, if we plot all the points here that are within one, whose, whose distance from the 
data points mean is within one standard deviation, we obtain these points here shown in yellow. One thing that we spot here is that the, this coordinate has no effect on the distance, whereas this one, you see, it's really banded. We get this kind of band. Why is that? Well, it's because the units for, that are used for disease progression are much larger than those used for body mass index. This is why this is the shape of our neighbourhood. Now, it's slightly confusing because, it's an, if, if you like, it's an artefact of the fact that the units are so different. We see that because of the units of body mass index are so much less than the units of the quantitative measure of di disease progression, the body mass index doesn't contribute much to the distance. This difference in units can confuse some clustering algorithms. So let us therefore normalize the units so, they, so that both variables fall within this interval from 0 to 1. Well, how do we do this? We divide by the difference from the uh, between the maximum and the minimum distance. So we get the normalized underscore data underscore points. And when we plot um, the set of points whose distance falls within one standard deviation in these normalized units, we obtain a neighborhood of this shape, much more circular. You see, when we normalized both units. Now, this could be helpful for some clustering algorithms. They may implicitly normalize the units for you. OK, that was an application of um, norms or lengths of vectors. Now we're going to talk about the inner product, and we're going to introduce the angle between two vectors. The inner product or dot product of two vectors is the sum of products of their respe respective coordinates. So if our vectors, as in this example, are two-dimensional, the dot product of u and v is going to be the result of multiplying the first coordinates plus the results of multiplying together the second coordinates. In this particular case that we use as a, as a running example, where u is 5, 3 and v is 4, 6, the dot product between u and v is going to be 5 times 4, 5 times 4, plus 3 times 6, and we get 38. Let's check these calculations using Python's built-in function, np dot, and we get 38. Geometrically speaking, the inner product, when appropri appropriately normalized, gives the cosine of the angle in radians between the two vectors theta. The correct formula, the more precise formula, is that the co cosine of the um, angle between the vectors is going to be the inner product between uh, these two vectors divided by their lengths, by their norms. So the angle in radians between the two vectors 5, 3 and 4, 6, u and v, is going to be equal by this formula um, and we get 0.44 and so on radians. Or, if we divide by pi and multiply by 180, we get 25 degrees. And we can confirm this visually, making sure that the, uh, that the aspect ratio is actually consistent. We can confirm that this angle here is around 25 degrees. That is the application of the inner product. We also note that the norm of u is the square root of its inner product with itself. Two vectors u and v are said to be orthogonal or perpendicular if the, if the angle between them is 90 degrees, equivalent to pi over 2 radians, and since the cosine of pi over 2 is 0, this is equivalent to saying that their inner product is 0. Now consider, for example, uh, u and w, which is defined as 1 minus 5 third. If you compute the um, inner product between u and w, you get zero. These two vectors are orthogonal and you can check that the angle between them is 90 degrees. Right, so we get a 90 degree angle over here. Notice that the inner product is commutative just as vector addition is commutative. The inner product of u and v is equal to the inner product of v and u. 
Furthermore, if alpha is a scalar, then the inner product of alpha u and v is equal to alpha times the inner product of u and v. And the inner product of u plus v with w is equal to u inner product w plus v inner product w. These two properties together are referred to as the linearity in the first argument. The inner product is positive definite. In other words, for all vectors, the inner product um, of, of vector u with itself is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And it's going to be equal to zero if and only if u is zero vectors, that is, all its elements are equal to zero. We have looked at vectors in two dimensions. It's time to step up and start looking at these vectors in three dimensions. So far we have considered vectors that have two coordinates, each corresponding to coordinates on the two-dimensional plane R2. Instead, we could consider three-dimensional vectors such as A, 3, 5, 7, and B, 4, 6, 4. Now we can visualize them on, um, um, in, in a 3D space rather than on a plane. And as before, we're going to label an origin. And of course, we can only plot a projection of the three-dimensional plane. A three-dimensional space, I'm sorry. In the three-dimensional case, vector addition and multiplication by scalars are defined element-wise just as before. Only in this case, we have three coordinates rather than just two. So here we have plotted minus 1.5 times a along with a. So you can tell that, again, multiplying by minus 1.5, the scalar minus 1.5, produces a vector which is 1.5 um, times the length of the original vector and is pointing in the opposite direction to the original vector but along the same line in the three-dimensional space. We didn't need to restrict ourselves to three-dimensional vectors. We could easily define four-dimensional vectors, five-dimensional vectors, and so on. For example, we could have C equals 4, 7, 8, 2, and D equals minus 12, 3, 7, 3. NumPy can do arithmetics for us just as before. And we can do vector addition, and we can do multiplication by scalars element-wise just as before. We wouldn't be able to visualize four-dimensional vectors. We can nonetheless gain some geometric intuition by pretending that we deal with familiar two- and three-dimensional spaces. Notice that it would only make sense to talk about adding to the vectors u and v if they have the same number of elements. So it doesn't really make, se make sense to add a two-dimensional vector to a three-dimensional vector. In general, we talk about the vector space of two-dimensional vectors R2, the vector space of three-dimensional vectors R3. All of these are called Euclidean spaces. The vector space of four-dimensional vectors R4, also an Euclidean space, and so on. We mean that the vector 357 belongs to R3 here. We mean that 357 is an element of this Euclidean space R3. It makes sense to talk about the addition of two vectors if they belong to the same vector space. Let us now look at another application of higher dimensional vectors in data science. In data science we usually deal with tables of observations, such as this table from another data set, the real estate valuation data set from the paper by Ye and Xu. Build, building real estate valuation models with comparative approach through case-based reasoning. You can find this data set online. We are going to use the Pandas library to represent a small section of this data set, just five rows. And we see that it has the variables transaction date, house age, distance to the nearest MRT station, number of convenience stores, latitude, longitude, uh, and house price per unit area. Vectors are a natural way to represent table columns. In particular, if our goal is to predict or explain house price per unit area using the other columns, we define the re required vector of outputs as 37.9, 42.2, 47.3, 54.8, 43.1, 43 and we see these numbers are just the column over here. 
The actual data set is much longer than just the five rows that we, um, that we showed here. That's another application of vectors. In NumPy, we could just stick all these, all these numbers in, into a NumPy array to obtain a NumPy representation of a vector. Thus, NumPy is one of the most commonly used Python libraries, a workhorse underlying the work of many other libraries, such as Pandas, which we used to load this, uh, to represent this table, or in the language of Pandas, a data frame. Let us look at another application of dot product and link it to correlation. In data science, we often talk about the concept of correlation. We say, well, this quantity is correlated to some other quantity. If you're not sure about what this is, look it up. Let us generate some correlated normal Gaussian data using numpy.random dot multivariate underscore normal. And we are going to use the correlation of 0.75. This is the resulting um, cloud of Gaussian cloud of two-dimensional data points. Now, geometrically, correlation corresponds to the cosine of the angle between the centered, that is adjusted by the mean, data vectors. So, if we just look at those vectors of coordinates, the, 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 the first coordinate and the second coordinate in this two-dimensional Gaussian random variable, then we compute the, dot, the angle between them using the formula the dot product divided by the length of the two vectors, we get 0.748, roughly 0.75, which is the correlation that we use to generate these random variables. So geometrically, this angle between the vector of the first data 0 and data 1 is just, uh, it's a multivariate vector, right? In this case, it has 50,000 elements and and the other one has 50,000 elements. The, the angle between them is going to be, uh, the cosine of the angle between them is going to be 0.75. So we see that the dot product is directly linked to the concept of correlation. Now let us look at vectors in general, vector spaces. Not all vector spaces look like Euclidean vector spaces. Mathematicians like abstraction. Indeed, much of the power of mathematics is in abstraction. The notions of a vector and vector space can be further generalized as follows. Formally, a vector space, or equivalently linear space, over a field F, such as real numbers are, is a set V together with two operations that satisfy the following eight axioms. The first four axioms stipulate the properties of vector addition alone, whereas the last four involve scalar multiplication as well as, um, uh, possibly as well as addition. The first axiom, associativity of addition. U plus V plus W is the same as U plus V plus W in brackets. The second axiom is commutativity of addition. U plus V is equal to V plus U. Then there is axiom 3, which says that identity element of addition, there exists an, an element 0, or the 0 vector, such that when it is added to any other vector, yields the same vector V. Then there is axiom 4, inverse elements of addition. For each uh, vector V in the vector space, there exists its additive inverse, which we denote by minus V, such that V plus that additive inverse gives us 0. Then there is axiom S1, distributivity of scalar multiplication over vector addition. Alpha times U plus V is going to be equal to alpha times U plus alpha times V. Distributivity of scalar multiplication um, over field addition. The scalar alpha plus v beta multiplied by vector B V is equal to the scalar alpha times V plus the scalar beta times V. The next axiom is compatibility of scalar multiplication with field multiplication. So uh, multiplying the scalar alpha by the product of the scalar beta with vector V is equivalent to multiplying the product alpha times beta by uh, that scalar by the vector V. And the fourth axiom is the identity. Uh, the identity element of scalar multiplication or preservation of scale. When we multiply by the scalar 1, by the unit, we get back the same vector. So 
one, the, uh, the unit of the field uh, F, or in our case real numbers, is, um, is, is also the multiplicative identity for the vector space. So any set, along with two operations of addition and scalar multiplication uh, over a certain field, any set that satisfies these axioms is mathematically, to a mathematician, a vector space, a linear space. All the Euclidean vector spaces satisfy these axioms, but there are other vector spaces that behave like vector spaces. So we have seen examples, we've done arithmetics in, on the plane, uh, in three-dimensional space, in fact in four-dimensional space and so on. These are the so-called Euclidean vector spaces. Um, and their corresponding zeros are just vectors consisting of zeros. Now, we can verify that all the axioms for them hold using NumPy, but it's not a formal mathematical proof. We can just play around with some example vectors, say u, v, and w, and then we can check that the axioms hold. So, for example, brackets u plus v brackets plus w gives us the same result as u plus brackets v plus w. So we can check that the axioms for the vector spaces hold, and we can then verify using some Boolean logic that for these specific vectors, but we pick them arbitrarily, um, we, get, uh, we get consistency with axiom A1. Not that I remember these names of axioms or, or numbers that I gave to them in this definition. Let's verify A2, commutativity of addition. Okay, so it seems to hold for our example vectors. Uh, we can, in the similar way, verify A3, A4, S1, S2, S3, and finally, S4. Now, not all vector spaces look like Euclidean vector spaces. There are some more unexpected vector spaces, such as the vector space of functions. Consider functions from real numbers to real numbers. Let's uh, say that we have function f from real numbers to real numbers, and function g from real numbers to real numbers, we can define the sum of these functions as another function whose result is going to be just the sum of the results of function f and function g. We can similarly define the product of a function f with a scalar alpha, such that it is going to be a new function from real numbers to real numbers, whose result is going to be alpha times the result of the function f. It is then easy to see that functions with addition and scalar multiplication defined in this manner satisfy the axioms of a vector space, and in fact they also form a vector space. We can play around with, with, with this in Python. We can define some functions or lambdas in Python, say u and v. u is going to be 2 times x, v is going to be x squared, and w is going to be 3 times x plus 1, and then we can define the function for addition of, 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 function, uh, of functions, which will take two functions and produce another function whose result will be the, res the, the sum of the results of the input functions. And then we can use Python to check that in special cases the um, axioms A1, associativity of addition, holds. A2, commutativity of addition, holds as well. S1, for that, we, it, we can also define the scalar product of a function as another function whose result is going to be s times, s is the scalar, times the result of the original function. And we can check that s1 holds, and we can verify all the axioms in a similar manner. So, let us introduce some very important concepts about vector spaces. We have seen that vector spaces can be Euclidean vector spaces or, for example, space of functions. Um, a weighted biscalar sum of vectors is called a linear combination. So alpha 1 times v1 plus alpha 2 times v2 plus alpha 3 times v3 plus dot 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 plus alpha k times vk is a linear combination of vectors v1, v2, v3, dot dot dot, vk. So the result is 
itself a vector. In this case, it's 59.35, 31.75, and 56.125. Vectors v1, v2, up to vk are said to be linearly independent if none of them can be written as a linear combination of the remaining vectors. Thus, the vectors minus 3, 3, 5, 25, 7, 13, 1, 1, 1 1.5 are linearly independent, whereas the vectors minus 3, 3, 5, 25, 7, 13, 34, minus 2, minus 2 are not linearly independent because 34 minus 2 minus 3 can be written as minus 3 times the first vector plus 1 times the second vector. Vectors are set uh, are said to span a particular vector space if any vector in that vector space can be written as a linear combination of those particular vectors. So consider, for example, vectors 4, 6 and 5, 3, which we'll call u and v. Can we obtain another vector, say w equal to minus 7, 3, as a linear combination of these vectors u and v? In other words, can we find scalars x1 and x2 such that x1 times u plus x2 times v gives us the uh, third vector minus 7 and 3. This seems to be easy enough. We need to find x1 and x2 that satisfy this equation. Now, if we multiply out x, uh, the scalar multiplication here and scalar multiplication here, and then we carry out the vector addition, and equate the two vectors element-wise, we have two linear equations. 4x1 plus 5x2 equals to minus 7, and 6x1 plus 3x2 equals to 3. We can quite easily solve this system of linear equations, obtaining uh, x2 equal to minus 3 and x1 equal to 2. And we can indeed confirm that uh, 2 times u plus minus 3 times v gives us w, which is minus 7 and 3. We notice that there is nothing special about this w equal to minus 7 and 3 in the above example. We could take a general b equals b1, b2 and find such x1 and x2 that would satisfy this equation. Uh, we can solve this system of linear equations, and in this case we are going to get um, x2 is going to be one third of b1 minus two ninth of b2, and x1 is going to be minus one sixth of b1 plus five eighteenth of b2. We can check that these results are consistent with the above when b1 is equal to minus seven and b2 equals to three. Indeed they are. A set of vectors that span their vector space and are linearly independent are called a basis for that space. For example, the vectors e1, 1, 0, and e2, 0, 1, span the vector space R2 because any vector in the plane R2, b1 and b2, can be written as a linear combination of these vectors. And it's quite easy uh, to see that this linear combination is going to be given by b1 times e1 plus b2 times e2. e1 and e2 is what is known as the standard basis for the plane R2, for the Euclidean plane R2, but there are others. We have already seen that the vectors u and v, u equals 4, 6, and v equals 5, 3, span the Euclidean plane R2. In fact, they're linearly independent and also form a basis of R2. We have already seen that, the ch we have therefore seen uh, that the change of basis, it's a technical term, from E1, E2 to U and V, E1, E2 is the standard basis, 1, 0, 0, 1, is given by the above solution of the linear system of equations. Thus, we can uh, write uh, B equals B1, E1, plus B2, E2, equals X1, U, plus X2, V, uh, showing how we can go from this basis to this basis. Change of basis forms the basis, no pun intended, of many statistical and machine learning techniques, such as the Principal Components Analysis, or PCA. It can be shown that all bases, that's the plural for the word basis, for a particular vector space have the same number of elements, 
and that number of elements is called the dimension of that vector space. Thus, R2 have all the bases of R2 have two elements, so R2 is two-dimensional, unsurprisingly, R3 is three-dimensional, and so on. Whereas it can be shown that the vector space of functions, which we introduced above, is infinite dimensional. There is no way we can find a finite basis for that space, so it's infinite dimensional. The study of infinite dimensional vector spaces gives rise to a separate discipline called infinite dimensional analysis. Now, infinite dimensional analysis is quite hard, and if you want to learn it, we recommend the book by uh, Ali Prantis called Infinite Dimensional Analysis, A Hitchhiker's Guide, which is available, for example, from Amazon. Let us consider subspaces. A subset of a vector space is itself a vector space if it contains the zero vector and is closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Uh, it is then itself a uh, uh, um, it is then itself a vector space and it is called a subspace of the original space. For example, all multiples of the vector u, say 4, 6, uh, all scalar multiples of that uh, vector form a one-dimensional subspace of the two-dimensional vector space R2. Note that the zero vector, which must be present in any vector space, is present in the subspace since it is equal to the scalar zero times u, so it is in this subspace. Let us look geometrically at the geometric shape of subspaces of Euclidean spaces. Consider a subspace of the three-dimensional Euclidean space. Suppose that it contains a certain vector, say v1 equals to minus 3, 3, 5. We can uh, produce a plot of this vector on, in, in, in the three-dimensional space. But by the axioms of the vector space, it must also contain all scalar multiples of v1, that is, for example, minus 1.5 times v1, 1.5 times v1, 3 times v1, and so on. So geometrically, if we plot all these multiples, we will obtain this line, right? So our subspace will look like this line. Mathematically, this means that our subspace contains the line going through v1 and through the origin. Our subspace could well be that line, but suppose that it contains another vector v2 which is linearly independent from v1, say v2 equals to 25, 7 and 13. The same argument as above applies, so our vector space must also contain all scalar multiples of v2, and it must therefore contain these two lines. But the axioms of the vector space require that the vector space also contain all linear combinations of v1 and v2. Geometrically, this means that it contains not just these two lines, but the entire plane which contains these two lines, um, uh, all which, which is formed by all linear combinations of these two vectors. So geometrically, our subspace must contain, or must be even, unless it contains another vector, this linear independent vector must contain this plane. What if the subspace does contain another vector which is linearly independent of both v1 v and v2, say v3? If that is the case, since we can obtain any point in three-dimensional plane as a linear combination of three vectors, linearly independent vectors, our subspace is actually going to be equal to the entire three-dimensional space. It is worth mentioning that the subspace containing one and only one vector, 0, 0, 0, just the zero vector, automatically satisfies all the axioms of a vector space and is therefore a trivial subspace of R3. Thus, geometrically, a subspace of the Euclidean space R3 is either the zero vector, or a line through the origin, or a plane through the origin, or the entire R3. We can extend this reasoning to high dimensional Euclidean spaces. A subspace of the Euclidean space R4 is either the zero vector, or a line through the origin, or a plane through the origin, or a three-dimensional hyperplane through the origin, which we cannot easily visualize, or the entire R4. Not every line in R3 is a subspace of R3. Only the lines going through the origin as a vector space must contain the zero vector. Similarly, not every plane in R3 is a subspace of R3 only the planes containing the origin. So a plane may be a subset of a vector space, but not a, a subset of a vector space, <coughs> but not a subspace. Finally, let us consider the equation of a plane. 
Consider a plane in three dimensions, which contains the point P, with coordinates P1, P2, and P3, equal to 1, 2, and 3, and such that the vector V, um, equal to V1, V2, V3, which is equal to 1, 1, 2, is orthogonal to that plane. A vector is, is orthogonal to a plane if and only if it is orthogonal to vectors joining any two points in that plane. In particular, to an arbitrary for an arbitrary point <coughs> x equal to x1, x2, and x3, the vector from it to p is orthogonal to v. This equation is sufficient for us to work out the equation of the plane. So the left-hand side is going to be equal to this um, inner product, and if we write it out, we end up with the equation x1 plus x2 plus 2x3 equals to minus 9. Putting this together with the right-hand side, which is 0, we get the equation of the plane, x1, x2, 2x3 equals 9. Every point in that plane satisfies this equation. In particular, we can check that p satisfies it. p1 plus p2 plus 2p3 is going to be equal to 9. And conversely, if a point satisfies this equation, it belongs to that plane. So, for example, if we pick x coordinate equal to 2, x2 coordinate to 1, then the equation of the plane mandates that the third coordinate must be equal to 3. The point 2, 1, 3 also belongs to this plane. You may be wondering how we obtain the equation of the plane containing the vectors v1 and v2 in one of the examples above. Well, the so-called cross-product operation on two vectors gives a vector that is orthogonal to both of them. So, if we perform the cross-product on v1 and v2, we will get the equation of the vector that is orthogonal to both of these vectors. Um, the, another technical term is the normal, normal orthogonal, or orthogonal to this plane uh, containing these two vectors, and then we can proceed as above to find the equation of the plane. Finally, I'm going to mention some other uh, sources that you can follow uh, to read up on linear algebra uh, on vectors. We've only just started looking at linear algebra, we've introduced vectors. Um, the next step would be to start looking at matrices. An excellent deeper introduction to linear algebra can be found in Professor Gilbert Strang's video lectures for the 1806 linear algebra course at MIT. The supporting textbook for that course is Introduction to Linear Algebra. Uh, it's now the fifth edition of that book is now available from Gilbert Strang. A more recent version of this book, updated for data science and deep learning, is Linear Algebra and Learning from Data by Gilbert Strang, published in 2019, and it focuses on some um, machine learning applications. Another good text on linear algebra is Linear Algebra, the third edition by Fraley and, Ray, and, and Beauregard, um, and it's also available from Amazon. One may also be recommended to read Schaum's Outline of Linear Algebra, 6th edition, by Lipschitz and, Lips, uh, and Lipson. Finally, we recommend getting hold of M2N1 Numerical Analysis Lecture Notes from Brad Baxter, uh, which uh, a course that he gave some time ago at Imperial College. Uh, they also contain some very useful exercises. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure talking to you about Linear Algebra.